scripture reading this morning, we continue with Luke's gospel. Last week, we read from the very end of this chapter. Today, we read from the very beginning. Listen now for the word of God as it comes to us from the 13th chapter of the gospel of Luke. At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, that they were worse sinners than other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Or those 18 who were killed in the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish, just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it, but found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I've come looking for fruit from this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should I be wasting its soil? The gardener replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Now sends our reading for this morning. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. six months, along with my family, hit the news this week. Most of you are aware of what I'm talking about. I had an interview this week with a reporter from the Daily Record, and he asked me, have you preached about this? There's a good sermon in this. I said, no, I had not. I said, I needed to have people know about it first. So now it's my time to talk about it. So many of you are quite aware of what happened. I'm going to try to give a real brief summary. On April 16th, I went to my bank, Wells Fargo, and deposited four checks, like I do maybe twice a month in the ATM machine. And on that same day, someone else with sinister intent deposited fraudulent checks. And when the state police asked Wells Fargo for pictures of who had done this, they provided my pictures. I did not hear about this for another three months. On July 8th, the state police posted the pictures of me taken at the ATM machine, and they're not really my best pictures. <laughs> <laughs> but they are pretty clearly me. They posted them on their Facebook page, seeking the public's help in identifying this person who had made illegal deposits of stolen checks. And then Anna Weiss, bless her heart, the next day, July 9th, having heard from her daughter that it looks like Pastor Jeff is on the state police website, 
she sent me a text saying, you have a twin. <laughs> and when I got to open it up, it wasn't just somebody who resembled me when I realized it was my bank, my ATM machine, where these illegal deposits had been made. Those were my pictures. And when I went online and looked at my bank statement, I had indeed made the positive four checks on that day to my account. And so I promptly got on the phone to call the state police, terrified that my image was being spread far and wide. In less than 24 hours, it had been shared 466 times, and my mind began to explode with the math of that, and how lots of people who don't know me would come to the conclusion that Pastor Jeff is not to be trusted. Fortunately, the state police took down the post promptly when I asked them to. I assumed that in providing evidence that I made uh, real deposits on the day, that would solve it. But the state police said, we get all our information from Wells Fargo, from their security department in Arizona, and uh, we'll check it out. And the next day he called and said, did you have a beard on that day? <laughs> and I said, yes, I did. And yeah, those are my clothes, and that's definitely me. Had to ask, he said. Wells Fargo is standing by their claim. Oh, we're sending them your legitimate deposits, and we will hear back, and we will let you know, for good or for bad, what we hear. When I didn't hear, for three weeks I called. I said, we're still waiting. We'll let you know whether it's good or bad. I didn't hear for four weeks. I thought they'd figured out the mistake and they wanted me to just go away. And then when I got back from Labor Day weekend, there was a call from the state police sounding very casual. Would you mind coming down to our headquarters in Homedale and we can just sort of wrap this up. I was irritated and I, I wanted to know how this happened. I wanted to have some answers and I'd also discovered along the course that my picture had been posted out there in cyberspace and a number of different websites. And so I went down there uh, with nothing to hide and without a lawyer and was taken into an interrogation room and they showed me these pictures with handwritten check numbers and said, this proves that you did it, confess. And I said, I didn't do it. There is some kind of mistake of technology here on Wells Fargo's part. Uh, and uh, at one point I asked them, how would you find legitimate checks line up time-wise with the illegal check deposits? And they answered, we don't know. Um, and so they, they arrested me, they took my mug shots, and they took my fingerprints and they gave me a court date. And I appeared in court two times and the state police did not provide their information. So it wasn't until the third time that the judge threw out the charges. And when we finally got all their information, it was clear that they, on the very day they posted my picture, they had interviewed the woman, young woman whose debit card had been used for these illegal transactions. And she had talked about how she had given them to a man she knew only as Cousin Swing, and Cousin Swing and I looked nothing alike. <laughs> and on the day after the deposit in Parsippany in Glen Ridge, somebody looking a lot like Cousin Swing made a fifth illegal deposit, and it shows up on a camera. And as I understand it, after two weeks, this particular ATM machine in Parsippany, it releases all of its data. So there was no way when the state police resubpoenaed the Wells Fargo for them to actually check their original determination. But nonetheless, they stood by their determination. They couldn't come up with the check numbers, so they wrote them randomly on the pictures and in a manner that if you look at it, is clearly random, out of order, out of sequence. And uh, there are other things I could tell you about. But finally, the charges are dismissed.
So it's been difficult, it's been painful, but a lot of people suffer more painful things. But I want to tell you about my first interview with a, a, my lawyer wanted to get publicity out there, the notion of calling to account, particularly Wells Fargo, for their negligence in this. So he set up an interview with a reporter from Star Ledger. And in the course of the interview, he asked me, this must have, was this a test of your faith? This must have been a test of your faith. And I said, well, no, it, it wasn't a test of my faith. If I was going to think about this in terms of my faith, I would say that God gave me an opportunity in this ordeal to shine some light in some places that need to have some light shown about some systems that can make this happen and can happen for people with a lot less privilege than myself. He didn't print that part of the quote. He liked the idea of it being a test of my faith, and so he, he put that into the paper, um, which irritates me a little bit. And that brings me to this morning's gospel reading. There, there is a connection here. So, Jesus is heading to Jerusalem, where he is going to lay down his life. And the word is going around about this horrific injustice that has occurred, where some Galilean pilgrims to Jerusalem, in the midst of offering their sacrifices as the Torah commands, have been slaughtered by Pilate's soldiers. And whenever these kinds of things happen, people want to know why, how, what does it mean? And in large swaths of the Old Testament, there is this basic idea that if you live a faithful life, faithful to God, if you do right, then you will be rewarded with a good life. And if you do bad, if you don't keep faith with God, you'll get punished. It's a big part of the Old Testament. Uh, and the implication in the question when they bring it to Jesus is, so were these Galileans punished for some sin they did? And Jesus says, that's crap. <laughs> I don't think that's an exact quote, but he says something like that. <laughs> Um, God does not punish people with bad things happening. That's not how it works. Uh, these Galileans were no worse sinners than the rest of you. We are all sinners. Um, and so the interesting thing is that the reporter's question came from the very same place. You know, the idea was, I'm a pastor. I have lived a pretty faithful life, a pretty moral life. Shouldn't I expect, therefore, not to have bad things happen to me? Where are you, God? And that's stupid. If that's what my faith has been about, I haven't deposited fraudulent, fraudulent checks, but I've been preaching a fraudulent faith. Because Bad things can happen to people who are trying to live a good life and do the best they can. And Jesus wanted you to know that. And he goes on, Jesus does, to bring up another situation. This one that's not about injustice, it's about one of those things that just happens in life. There's these 18 people in Jerusalem and there's this tower, the Tower of Siloam, and it collapsed and 18 people get killed. And no, they weren't worse sinners than anybody else either. You know, bad stuff happens in life. People get diagnosed with cancer. It is not God's punishment for you. That's not how it works. You know, people we love get taken from us with car accidents. It's not God's punishment. That's not how it works. It's a great mystery why these things happen, but it's not about punishment that much. We know. And sometimes when bad things happen, then over the course of time, some good things can come out of it. And for me, there's been good things that have come out of this. One is the simple appreciation of how truly fortunate I am, you know? I have a whole community, a family and a community that love me and support me, and I have the resources to hire a competent lawyer, and I am a very blessed man. 
that realization. And then second, that I do feel like I have been given an opportunity. I mean, it's a great story, isn't it? A pastor gets uh, accused of uh, fraudulent checks. I've been given an opportunity to expose some light about some practices that are part of systems that shouldn't happen and happen pretty routinely. And maybe by putting this pressure of what I went through and to what our family struggled, then some other people will have less occasion to suffer that. Through all of what happens in this interchange with Jesus, with the others, he keeps coming back to, and yet we all need to repent. And we misunderstand what repentance means. It's not about groveling in a sense about what a horrible person I am with all the bad things. Repentance, the Greek word for repentance means you've got to change your mind. You have to start to think and see the world the way God sees it, which is altogether different from the way we see it. It means coming out of this self-centered place where it's ultimately all about me and to somehow see ourselves as all connected in this great love that cherishes every single person. That's the repentance that has to happen. That's what it means to truly be alive, is to be embodied, embodying that love that is God's love. That's what true repentance is about. And we need that to happen. And hopefully it happens before we die. And then Jesus proceeds to tell this little parable. And it's pretty simple. There are three characters in the parable, if you count the fig tree as a parable character, and I'm going to count the fig tree as a character. There is a fig tree and a man's vineyard. And over the course of time, it has not been producing figs. And the vineyard owner is not happy. He thinks it's time to chop down this fig tree that's not producing figs. It's just taking up space. The gardener steps in and says, hold on, wait a minute, calm down. Let's give it a little more time. Let's, let me dig and loosen up the soil. Let me put some donkey poop on it. Because you know how much nu nutrients are in donkey poop. It's in it, it's manure, that's what donkey poop is, right? He said, let's put donkey poop on it, and with more nutrients, maybe it will indeed now produce the figs that it was designed by God to produce. Interesting story. What the heck does it mean? Well, the first thing to say is that parables don't mean one single thing. They're the sort of thing that you wrestle with, you get inside of, and you can hear different things over time, and that's how it should be. I think it's safe to say the one thing it's safe to say is that the fig tree represents a human being. Uh, some people have interpreted this parable to be vineyard owner is God the Father, and the gardener is Jesus, and they're disagreeing. And Jesus is trying to persuade God not to have his wrath expressed on the tree. So you've got two of the parts of the Trinity arguing, in essence, which is idiotic because Jesus and the Father are one. They don't disagree about these things. Maybe we need the Holy Spirit to come and break the tie, huh? <laughs> so that's not really what this parable is about. What does seem more fruitful, though, is to think of the vineyard owner as being the idea we often have about how God should be acting in this world, you know? Particularly if we don't think we're the fig tree. Come on, God, wipe out the bad people in the world so that the rest of us can have a good time without being harassed by their evil. Why aren't you that God in the Old Testament that punishes the unrighteous and rewards the righteous. That's kind of what the vineyard owner represents. And that's all good and well, as long as you can comfortably keep that distinction and that fig tree is not you or me. 
it's some bad person out there. But if you reflect a little more, you recognize that maybe there is something inside of me that is like that figless fig tree, then that's not such great news. It means we are, we're calling for God to zap us, to chop us down. So, all of us, as Jesus said, need to repent, which is to say all of us spend a great deal of our time in this sort of self-centered consciousness that is the way of the world. And somehow we're being asked to, tr to shift into this new way of seeing the world, which is God's way of seeing the world, which isn't have us, our little ego, at the center of everything, but sees the grand love that encompasses everything. That's the shift that needs to take place. And if you're like me, you know that you spend a good deal of the time in that ego-centered place that sees the world as all ultimately about myself. So, I'm the figless fig tree. And so, when the gardener asks for a little mercy, a little grace, a little patience, that's good news for me. And I think it's good news for you too. And it's interesting that the parable encompasses two things that need to be held together. It encompasses, on the one hand, there's a need for grace because that's what the gardener is doing a little digging around for loosening up the soil and putting the donkey poop on is. That's grace. You never thought of donkey poop as being grace, but that's what it is. It is the gift that's needed to be able to be who you were meant to be. But the story also simultaneously implies that the fig tree's got some responsibility. And you need to hold both of those together. We are accountable, and yet we are powerless on our own, and we need God's grace. The two go together. And it's extraordinary how Jesus could come up with these parables that have all this wisdom in it. I shared with a little gathering of men on Friday afternoon that meets this story I came across by this columnist who writes, for a newspaper in Chattanooga on Sundays, a, a column that's uh, apparently from a Christian point of view, is called The Two Lives of Tyler Moore. And any talk, he talks about this 28-year-old African-American male in Chattanooga, who at the age of 14, having lost his mother and his father, became a member of a gang and by 18, he was in prison. And he was in prison for four years, full of rage, and just got more and more angry. And he was released from prison, and he hadn't changed, and in six months, he's back in prison. But this time, he gets placed in a cell with what he describes as an older, wiser inmate. Uh, and this is, I'm reading now from the article and from Tyler Moore. That's, uh, the author saying, that's when he woke up. <clears throat> Guards moved <clears throat> him in with an older, wiser inmate who pierced Moore's illusions. This old guy tells me, you can be angry at the world or you can get your mind right, Moore remembers. And his awakening began. I changed my life, he said. I stopped blaming others. At the end of the day, I had to take responsibility. Waking up meant changing his mind. He put down behaviors that led to war and picked up behaviors that led to peace. <clears throat> I read over a thousand books in prison. I meditated and prayed to myself. He said, you have God and the devil residing in yourself, he said. It's up to you who you choose. <clears throat> I preach accountability. And so he's been released from prison, and now he is uh, fortunate to have been provided with a way to make a living, because sometimes you don't have a way of living. It 
it's hard to, to, to allow these transformations to take root. But he has been very actively engaged in mentoring young African-American males that they don't end up taking the path that he took. It's pretty extraordinary. Uh, and he says, everybody has a role. You know, he preaches accountability to African-Americans and he preaches accountability to privileged white people. We all have a role to play in healing our society. Don't blame, Tyler says. Only see solutions, always practice love. And the author of this column adds, there are many types of prison you and I may be free to come and go as we please, but if we are locked in habitual mental patterns of destruction and negativity, then we are not free at all. There is no life beyond repair. And so there is that fig tree. And it's not been producing the fruit. It's not been a vessel of love. But the garden is going to put some donkey poop on it. You're going to dig around and loosen up the soil. That's the grace. That's the grace for this man. <clears throat> that this man had the fortune, the blessing of being placed with this wiser elder who had, had gone down the wrong path and had discovered the right path and could now show this guy the right path and call him into accountability. That was the grace, the gift that was given him. But the accountability you got to, at some point, recognize that you were put on this earth to be a channel of God's love, to bear the fruit of love. Each of us bears that responsibility to recognize that. And then in recognizing it and realizing how hard it is to change, to reach out to God for that grace that changes that which we cannot change ourselves, that transformative grace of God's love and mercy that works in places inside of us that we can't reach. That's the good news. And bad things happen to all kinds of people. But in every instance, we have an opportunity in some small way to bring light into darkness. And it's our choice. Please pray. given us life. And thank you for creating us in your image and likeness with capacity within us to bear fruit of love, to be channels of your love and blessing in this world. But we would acknowledge that so much of the time we get caught up in ourselves because the world models that for us. We ask for your grace to transform us, to set us free, that we might love as Jesus has loved, or at least begin to move in that direction. Allow us to recognize this life that we have been given is a gift and a privilege, and it is we are called to account, to offer our lives to you to bless this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.